Welcome back to the Jamzy Online YouTube channel. We're jumping right into the video here with polishing the crankshaft out of my personal 5.3 liter LC9 engine, which experienced the common failure of an AFM lifter. Luck was on my side, however, as the crankshaft had virtually no wear, and in fact the main bearings and the rod bearings looked nearly perfect upon teardown, meaning a quick polish after the balancing was all the crankshaft needed to be ready to run. With everything clean and ready for assembly, it was time to verify that our main bearing oil clearances were acceptable for this application. So we mic'd all of the main journals of the crankshaft and transferred the measurement to a bore gauge in order to measure the clearances, which came out around just over two thousandths on all journals. Satisfied with the main bearing clearances, I went forward to double check the rod bearing clearances in a similar manner. Running a set of one thousandths undersized rod bearings put me between 1.7 and 2.1 thousandths clearance on all eight rods, which is on the border of the tight side of where I wanted to be, but standard bearings opened it up farther than I wanted to see. Knowing that all of our crankshaft bearing clearances were within our determined tolerance for this application, it was time to move forward with getting the crankshaft installed in the block. As you can see, we're running a set of ARP main studs and giving the bearings a quick coat of cleavite bearing guard before setting the crankshaft in place, and also giving the lower bearings in the caps a quick coat before setting them in place and tapping them gently until they have seated in the block. It's recommended to use a small dab of silicone sealer under the head of the side main bolts to avoid future oil leaks, and after lightly snugging down all the fasteners, we bump the crankshaft back and forth a few times, ending with bumping the crankshaft forward in order to align the thrust bearing. At this point, we're free to go ahead and tighten down all of the main caps, being sure to follow the recommended torque procedure from ARP bolts. With all the main caps seated and torqued, it's always satisfying to give the crankshaft that first spin by hand and make sure everything is feeling okay. Finally, we'll go ahead and double check the crankshaft end plate, which came in just over three thousandths, which I'm satisfied with. So I want to take a quick break to give you guys a little bit of an update. This is the new shop that we're working on. We just pretty much have to finish the interior and some of the electrical. I also have my pickup here and the engine is almost installed. I'm almost ready to do the first fire. So that's what you guys can stay tuned for. I also want to take a minute to talk about our sponsor for this video, Skullbliss. Skullbliss offers ethically sourced animal skulls in a decorative fashion. Their process takes authentic skulls, which are a byproduct of local Balinese agricultural industries, and transforms them into detailed works of art that offer an impressive touch to any home or office. Their unique process and attention to detail yields a work of art that someone like myself can truly appreciate, knowing that in a way it's similar to the attention to detail required in the work I do here in the shop day in and day out. And while this Longhorn Skull looks absolutely amazing mounted to the front of my dad's little Ford Courier, I think it's going to make a great housewarming gift for my father-in-law who recently moved to Texas. We want to say a huge thank you to Skull Bliss for recognizing the hard work we do here in the shop and reaching out to share their work with us and our audience. If you or someone you know has been looking for the perfect finishing touch to their home or office, be sure to check out the links in the description and let them know that we really appreciate their support of our channel. Thank you for staying patient for the quick sponsor break, but jumping back into it here, we're installing the new camshaft that I chose for this build. Being a daily driver, I didn't want to sacrifice too much drivability, so I decided to go with the Elgin 1838P, otherwise known as the Sloppy Stage 1 cam. This cam does away with not only the AFM system, but the VVT system as well. With the cam thrust plate installed, I installed the crankshaft sprocket, and I opted to go with Chloe's three-way adjustable timing set, allowing me some adjustability to advance or retard the cam if needed. To start with, I'm installing it straight up or dot to dot in order to degree the camshaft. For a quick rundown on degreeing the cam, first step is to get the degree wheel installed at true top dead center. Using a positive stop on the piston, we rotate the crank until the piston hits the stop, noting the degree of the wheel before rotating the opposite direction until the piston stops again, and adjusting our pointer to make the two numbers match, which gives us an accurate top dead center. It might take a try or two if you're dumb like me and move the pointer the wrong way the first time. At this point, we'll have a lifter and an indicator installed on the intake lobe of the cam. So right there, we're 50 thousandths intake open at two after top dead center. And the spec on the cam is 50 thousandths timing intake opening at minus two before top dead center. So we're on the money there. So there's 50 thousandths on the way closed. Should be 39 after bottom dead center. Pretty, pretty close. While we had a piston installed for checking, I decided to go ahead and double check our piston and valve clearance, even though I have a pretty mild cam, but it's better to check than wish you had. If you follow our short form content on shorts, reels, or TikTok, you probably already saw this video in depth. 
Long story short, we had plenty of clearance. Moving forward with getting the rest of the rotating assembly installed, we went ahead and checked our ring end gap. Out of the box, the Hastings rings I'm using had 20 thousandths end gap on the top ring and 19 thousandths end gap on the second ring, which is acceptable based on the recommendations from the piston manufacturer for our desired application of this engine. Knowing that our rings were ready to go, it was time to go ahead and get the pistons mounted to the connecting rods. The forged icon pistons that I'm using in this build are a full floating design, and as such, use circlips to retain the wrist pin and keep the assembly together. We start by working one of the clips into place, following the recommended orientation from the manufacturer. It's always necessary to lubricate the moving components like this, so as we're building the assembly, I like to use a bit of assembly lubricant in the bores of the piston, as well as on the rod. Once the wrist pin is in place, it's as simple as installing the circlip on the opposite side of the pin and double checking that they're both fully seated, ending with a bit of oil worked into the moving parts. Installing the rings is a pretty simple process when you get the hang of it, starting with the lower oil control ring and then installing the second and first compression rings, being sure not to spiral on the compression rings and risk damage. The orientation of the ring end gap seems to be a controversial topic among the industry, but I simply follow the recommendation of the orientation from Hastings, as my rule of thumb is to trust the people who engineered the parts that I'm using. When you have a ring compressor that works well and the top of the cylinders has been properly chamfered, installing the pistons is really a breeze. Generally, we run a thick bead of assembly lubricant around the cylinder wall before installing the piston, and then tap the piston into place carefully to avoid breaking any rings. I typically install both piston assemblies for one rod journal of the crankshaft before rolling the engine over on the stand and pushing the pistons down the cylinder until the connecting rod seats against the crankshaft. I should also note that the rod bearing has been lubricated with assembly lube prior to the installation as well. As always, a note on that not so common common sense is to keep an eye on everything and avoid dinging the crankshaft or damaging the bearing as you're pushing it into place. These are the stock Gen 4 cracked cap connecting rods original to this engine, but as you may remember, we did go with a set of ARP rod bolts. After lubing the crankshaft, the caps are installed, being sure to correctly align them and seat them before tightening them down completely. Previously, we've determined a torque spec that gives us the 5.5 thousandths to 6 thousandths bolt stretch recommended by ARP, and at this point, we'll go through and double check that all of the bolts are torqued to that spec and our rotating assembly is fully installed. Everything seems to be rotating nicely and we do have connecting rod side play, so we're good to move forward. At this point, we're installing the oil pump. Since I've done away with the AFM and VVT systems, I simply went with a Melling standard volume, standard pressure oil pump. Following Melling's recommendation to align the pump, we bring the mounting bolts up just snug and rotate the crankshaft at least one full revolution before torquing down the bolts. With the ARP main studs, I did have to grind a couple of larger holes in the windage tray before installation, but it was only a minor modification and a quick and easy install, saying goodbye to our view of the crankshaft once and for all. At this point, we headed back to the top side of the engine to get some of our valve train installed. Starting with lubricating the lifter guide trays and installing our new LS7 valve lifters on all eight cylinders, doing away with those pesky AFM lifters that caused this failure in the first place. Before installing the heads, it's important to remember to tighten up the bolts on those guide trays. For our head gaskets, we're using the OEM style multi-layer steel head gaskets, paying attention to install them in the correct orientation with the front label towards the front of the engine. We will set our freshly built heads in place on top of the engine and install the ARP head bolts that we ordered, being sure to follow the recommended torque procedure and pattern from ARP, as well as using the provided ultra torque fastener lubricant. As a quick reminder, you can find thousands of parts like the ones in this video for sale on our website, www.jamzonline.com. With the heads bolted on, the engine is really starting to look closer to being ready to go back in my pickup, but first we need to finish up installing the valve train. To test out one of the products we sell on our website, I decided to go with the Yelaterra Ultralight Rocker System, which are an aluminum body, roller tip, shaft and pedestal rocker arm setup. With cylinder one on the base circle of the camshaft for both intake and exhaust, we install our push rods and slowly tighten the intake and exhaust rocker arms down evenly until we achieve what is effectively zero lash. At this point, we tighten down the rocker arm bolts evenly in quarter turn increments, taking note of the number of turns required until the bolt is completely tight against the pedestal. As per the instructions, each quarter turn of the bolt seems to equate to roughly 10 to 12 thousandths lifter preload. In addition, the instructions indicate you may need to use a shim under each pedestal, as I am here. With the number of quarter turns counted, our intake side will have around 25 to 30 thousandths preload, which may be a tad light, but the exhaust is right where I want it, at around 35 thousandths to 40 thousandths preload. Knowing that we're happy with our preload and our geometry looks good, it's time to go through and do the final assembly of the valve train. 
Each end of the push rod gets a dab of assembly lubricant as well as the tip of the valve stem. And in addition, the roller components of the rocker arm receive a bit of oil to ensure they have lubrication upon initial startup. Again, given that the intake and exhaust rocker arms are mounted to the same shaft, it's important to tighten their bolts down evenly before the final torque. While the instructions say you only need to check the preload on one cylinder, it's a habit to roll through the firing order and check each setup with the lifters on the base circle of the cam for that cylinder, just for peace of mind. Finally, we're ready to cover some of this stuff up, but these rocker arms do require a bit more space, so we have an extra thick valve cover gasket and nuts on the valve cover bolts, which act as a spacer to keep the valve cover from interfering with any of the rocker arms throughout their travel. Now we're going to give the valve train hopefully one last look for a long long time and get it covered up so that we can move on to wrapping up the final touches of the engine. The rear cover is reused but a new rear crank seal will be installed which is done by simply pressing the seal carefully into the cover using a bit of lacquer thinner as a lubricant to make it go smoothly. The rear cover is carefully installed to avoid damaging the seal and the bolts are brought up just snug. Similarly, the new timing cover which replaces my VVT timing cover is installed and again brought up snug, not tight yet. Using a harmonic damper install tool, the damper is carefully installed onto the snout of the crankshaft. Using the old crankshaft bolt, which I should note is torqued to yield and should not be reused, we torque the bolt to ensure that the damper is fully seated. At that point, we remove the bolt and install a new ARP crankshaft bolt and torque it to the proper specification. The damper being installed helps align the timing cover, at which point you can final torque the bolts as long as you're sure to keep the bottom face aligned with the pan rails of the block, as goes for the rear cover as well. All four corners where the block meets the cover should get a light bead of silicone sealer to prevent any leaks before our oil pan gasket is installed. By the way, I also installed the oil pickup tube somewhere along the way with a proper new o-ring, and I also replaced the oil relief valve in the pan with a plug since I have eliminated the VVT and AFM. With the pan in place, the bolts can be evenly snugged up, and this engine build is nearing completion and ready for installation. My pickup was waiting over in the other shop, so with the ports taped off to prevent any unwanted debris, we loaded it into the back of my dad's pickup and brought it out to the new shop. At this point, we hooked onto it with the loader and it was time to drop the engine in. This time we wised up and took the hood off to give us a bit more room, and my mom offered to help guide it into place. Unfortunately, we were almost up to the transmission when we realized our load leveler would interfere with the firewall, so we had to come back out and hook on with a single chain. Now I'm not gonna lie, this was pretty late one evening and we were all pretty tired and cranky, so as soon as we had it up to the transmission with a bolt in on either side, we called it a night. Fast forward a couple days later, I figured I was making good progress and it would be a good time to prime the engine with oil. On Amazon, I found a plug that adapts to a 1 8 pipe thread, perfect to run a fitting for our pressurized engine oiler. Basically, we take the weight of the container empty and put a few quarts of our driven braking oil in and pressurize the cylinder. Once we open the valve, the pressure pushes the oil through the engine as my dad rotates the crank and I continuously weigh the canister because we want to avoid running out of oil and blowing a ton of air into the system again. Sure enough, oil was making it to the top so we topped it off full and put in a 1 8 pipe plug. Alright, I got the engine all installed. I didn't film a lot of that because I'm not a mechanic and I honestly didn't know what I was doing so it was enough of a project for me to get this in without recording it. I've done a little bit of the tune on here, so I went in and disabled the variable valve timing and disabled the DOD, AFM, whatever you want to call it. So it should be good for the first start. Um, I don't know, that's a little bit out of my wheelhouse, honestly, but we're going to give it a go. Ready? Ready. Ready. Huh? And she runs. At this point, I'm working on learning myself to tune so I can get my emissions tests and get back to some further upgrades on this truck. Talk about satisfying. Thank you for watching, everyone. Be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one.